Ignition sequence start. Six. Five. It's one small four, step for man. Three, two. One. Everything is going. Welcome to Stay Relevant, my wandering conversations with interesting people. I'm Mike Savola. Welcome back. My guest today is Brian Kelly, the principal at uh, one of the principals of Single Malt Media. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Mike. Brian, you've been around for a while. Uh, I know, I, I think I met you, you were at Hedegar Media Development. Before then, you were at uh, Discovery in the startups, right? That's right. I, I spoke to, uh, oh, it was uh, Jeff Krulik. Oh, yeah. He said he'd worked with you way back when. Um, it's funny, so, Jeff's, Jeff's name came up yesterday. It's, it's, it's a small world. <laughs> How, uh, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me about your background. Well, out of college, I, my first job out of college was uh, Discovery Channel uh, back in the, in the early days, uh, you know, uh, late 1986. Uh, they launched in 1985. But, uh, you know, I, I was at Discovery about five years. I left um, to, you know, one of the uh, things about working inside the network is that you are, you manage the process of production or you are tangential to the, pro- pro- the process of production. You're not really in the process of production. Now, some people in the network might disagree with my view on that, but I wanted to be much more on the on the tactical side, not the strategic, at least getting into it at an early age. And some people like that. And and many people like that. And they truly believe that that is, um, you know, the truest form of production. But, you know, to be behind the camera, to, um, you know, be in the field, to go to Africa, to go to Southeast Asia, to to do all of the things that I've been able to do in my career, uh, I needed to get out of the office and need to get out of the structure of the network. And so I left initially to start... uh, uh, a small uh, entity that was called the Producers International. That was me and another guy, a uh, friend of mine that uh, I went to high school with who had also graduated with a communications degree and worked with NBC Sports. So we launched that, and I did that for a few years. Uh, you know, we were still offlining on, on three-quarter back in the days when I, when I first got into the business. Um, so I, I gave up my initial uh, venture into a kind of a, into a partnership or, or working for myself, and, and for lack of a better way of saying it, to go work for one of the largest production companies, uh, production entities in the uh, Mid-Atlantic area, uh, region, which was Henniger Media Services. They launched a division called Henniger uh, Media Development, which was a, for lack of a, for all intents and purposes, it was a production company. Uh, we specialized in the development of programming, nonfiction programming, for uh, National Geographic, Discovery Channel, and uh, ultimately many of the emerging networks that came out, the History Channel. And you're pretty uh, pretty successful there. Yeah, we programs. did pretty well. We did pretty well for a number of years. We we uh, we launched a, a number of uh, pretty high profile projects uh, at the time. Uh, Mini series Gold was, I think, History Channel's one of History Channel's highest rated miniseries. Uh, they were still rapidly advancing. I think you know in this day and age with with some of the stuff that they do. Uh, today, that you know, it's barely barely a blip on their radar. But in the early days, uh, we were doing some some pretty uh, groundbreaking stuff. We we did a we broke through with uh, NASCAR, and we did a, a oh, yeah. film about the year in life of NASCAR, which involved you know the the, the highest uh, you know talent within that organization at the time. Uh, Kenny Irwin was the rookie of the year. Jeff Gordon, who was uh, the so for several years running the uh, the driver of the year, and Dale Earnhardt were all kind of principals in that film, and um, you know those were were three of the biggest names I think in in NASCAR certainly at the time. Uh, in the case of Dale Earnhardt, probably one of the biggest names ever. So you were you left Henniger. What, what did you do after Henniger? Did you uh, go back to the Travel Channel? Or were you well, Henniger for a while. Henniger, I went to another production company, EFX Media, another big, okay. uh, larger right, production right. company in the area. Uh, their push kind of into marketing and more of a communications company, more hands-on production, where Henniger was was much more leveraged into the post-production world. And as post-production, you know, they were kind of a victim of their own success. They really uh, helped uh, in this region anyway launch uh, digital. You know, nonlinear post-production, and then nonlinear post-production became nonlinear production. Uh, po- it, you know, it dominated, went from being offline to just being the entire process. And I think that expansion uh, started to create some uh, contraction, and then we saw, you know, Henniger, uh, p- excuse me, pull back on a number of fronts. So I decided to get a little bit closer to the production side of things, or stay within the production side of things. I was saying that I left uh, Henniger to go to EFX Media. Uh, which was launching again into the into the, into the communications uh, marketing, strategic communications uh, realm, 
and uh, did that for several years, and then was recruited to go back to Discovery Channel, uh, Discovery Communications, at a senior production position uh, as vice president of production for Emerging Nets, and they needed somebody to help guide the uh, the production operations for. Uh, several of the networks that they had under their, that umbrella. But, you know, I found myself kind of at the higher levels of, of really what um, I had found early in my career that I, I didn't want to do. But, you know, I came back, at, you know, at a senior level, and it was still very much the same. It was much more uh, strategic, um, not as close to the production. Uh, Seems like it being strategic, it would be even further away from the production. Exactly right. I mean, it was an opportunity, you know, again, uh, you know, an opportunity that came along because I think we had a good track record. You know, it certainly solidified that, you know, at that stage of my life, I, I still wanted to be part of the, you know, the, the tactical production process. Uh, so I left Discovery um, in uh, 2009, uh, early 2010 to launch Single Malt Media, mm -hmm. which is the company that I, that I operate right now. And we launched that uh, as, a, as a true production company. Um, uh, I left Discovery with a couple of, of contracts to do programming for uh, the Military Channel. And how, is that, how has production changed over the years? It seems like there were a few companies doing a lot. I mean, before nonlinear, of course, you had to go through the big companies. You had to go through the post-production. It was too expensive. Um, and then nonlinear came along. Uh, the price started going down. Today, it's just everybody's out there. Everybody's doing it. There's a lot of noise to get through, I'm thinking. Yeah, there really is. I mean, you know, the... And I, th I think, it's, you know, it's part of it you can see in, in, the, in the titles of the people that are really sought after today in, in the television production world. And the networks are always looking for, you know, the, the showrunner, the people that can, that can manage a, an enormous amount of workflow through a, you know, a, a process of, of delivering a season or multiple seasons of, of, a, uh, of a production or a, of a title, a property, you know, a television property. And the, and, the, and the networks, by doing larger orders, have compressed, have tried to compress the, the actual cost of production and to make it more like an assembly line. So you have, you know, the very sought after showrunners and then the line producers, which are, are you know, they're, they're really managing a workflow. In the early days of crafting, or at least when I got into it, of crafting a film, you know, something that we called a film that was in itself a, you know, a body of work. Um, now you have to have a property, you know, that has, you know, multiple moving parts that they're wonderful things. I mean, they're wonderful things in, in how they're managed and, and how they're delivered. And, and with so many outlets now on the television, you, you know, it's about volume. It really is about volume. It, yeah, it seems to be, it's moved away from story. This, it's not the story, the focus, but it's more of, uh, I guess, the character is the focus. Character, talent. It's always, you know, when you talk to a network, it's always about the talent. So, you know, networks today are more inclined to build a property around the right talent than they are about developing a property and then selecting a talent afterwards. So if you if you found the right uh, combination of people, like, you know, you look at the Duck Dynasties or, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Pawn Stars and things like that, where you, you the, the, the talent was found, you know, almost in like in a subculture uh, uh, way where that you know they've, this group of people that you could craft a story around, and that's what was the selling point is that the fact that you had these attractive personalities, characters that yes. you could develop into stars or you could develop into in, into these characters, and that's not come without its you know its cost. I mean you know you delve into the to the subculture world. There's there's oftentimes baggage, and we've seen that, but what it does it creates an enormous opportunity for the network to invest in a an entity that is, I think, a little bit more predictable. Uh, and we call, a lot of this is called reality or falls under the reality TV genre, which uh, I guess is not reality per se because it's, it's what we call soft scripted, isn't it? Sure, yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's uh, scripted reality, to, contrived yeah. reality. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, recreating a reality. Um, you know, a lot of times, you, you know, you'll, you'll work on a story that, you know, is... It's not like doing a documentary, you're going back and telling history, but in this way you're trying to tell a, an active, 
uh, you know, kind of history where you're, you know, you're, you're immersing the audience in the actual events that took place. Uh, you know, so some of the, some of the shows we worked on, um, you know, you have to go back and, and there's really, from a viewer standpoint, you can't tell that it's not a, it's not, you know, reality television, at least you're not supposed to be able to, but, uh, today's shows are very heavily scripted. Where do you think it's going from here? Well, I, you I know, mean, we, we have a ton, a ton of this, you know, Duck Dynasty stuff, the, uh, you know, the, the little people, the, uh, the gold rush kind of thing, um, those kind of shows. Um, is it ever going to slow down? Well, I, th I think the, what, what's going to slow it down is the, uh, the delivery mechanism for how we, we consume television. You know, where uh, you know, my son, my 15-year-old my son, watches very little television now. He goes straight to the web to find his outlets. And he can find many of the things that are on television via the web or uh, uh, parts of the things that are on television via the web. But I think the actual uh, delivery mechanisms of, you know, launching a television network under an advertiser or a uh, cable, you know, carriage model, subscriber model, those, you know, those days are gone because, you know, they're, you know you're just not going to get the subscriber fees that, you know, Discovery Channel or some of the bigger uh, named uh, networks have been, have been getting for years. That, that is going to go away. I, you know, what television will look like 15 years from now, I know will be different. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, what that means, um, but I know that the method of which we we get television will drastically change, and it is changing, and it will continue to change. What about the quality of television? I mean, we talked about story-driven uh, pieces. Now, reality television, soft scripted stuff, and and the volume. You know, it, volume. If you have, if you need so much volume, the quality's got to go down. I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, the, the, you know, there's. We've seen technology have an impact on television, and, and we always feared that it was going to change, you know, the quality. You know, the, again, back to the offline digital editing thing and, you know, saying, okay, well, if you're not editing at the highest levels of, of what we, that model we used to call post-production, you're compromising. And we found out that not to be true. Then you had things like uh, DSLR technology that allowed us to shoot video. I mean, you know, DSLR cameras are fantastic. I mean, when you think about... Uh, a camera being able to shoot a 25 or, or 36 megapixel picture. You always knew that if they could put that capture technology into television, I mean, high definition television is what? It's the equivalent of about a 12 megapixel picture. So the fact that you have a camera, you know, that you can hold in your in the palm of one hand that can shoot a 25 megapixel picture, you know, the, the convergence of those two things obviously were, were um, uh, promising something. And, and, you know, the fact now that we can shoot full 4K, on a on a digital SLR is a, is a huge thing. Now, um, a lot of people say, well, putting a you know a 4K camera in the hands of somebody you know that you can buy three four thousand dollars and it's not a hundred thousand dollar camera that we paid ten years ago is going to change the quality of it. Will it change the quality of, of how the production is done? I'm I'm not sure. I think I think at the end we still want to have or the viewer still wants to have strong stories, but I think the ability to tell those stories is is becoming more and more accessible. So you're seeing new ways of doing it. And uh, uh, I think there's maybe a little bit of pushback now on the scripted reality. You know, what's next, uh, I guess, remains to be seen. You know, the, the, the development, of, you know, visionaries of, uh, of, uh, that are out there now, you know, we'll probably will come up with some idea that will, you know, we'll all kind of shake our heads and say, really? Or, or you know, or maybe we'll say, wow, who knows? But, um, you know, I've been skeptical of a lot of, uh, you know, where television has been going. I, you know, I, simply because of my background, but you either adjust, you know, you, you had called me about this staying relevant, you either adjust or you, or you kind of back out and go, you know, you sell insurance. You know, let's do something else. Right. And so we're, we're trying to do is we're trying to stay part of the game by doing things like the aerial photography or some just aerial cinematography. Let me get to that in a second, but I want to go back to what you just mentioned just real quick. Um, the whole technology thing, I mean, uh, I think there's a couple things going on there. I mean, the, the, it, it, the cost of technology and the quality, the cost goes down, the quality continues to rise. It puts it in the hands of a lot of people, um, and it makes it accessible. And there's a couple things going on there. There are a lot of people who don't know what to do. They don't know how to use it, uh, but they have good ideas. So they can, they can uh, it's kind of like uh, butting heads up against those two ideas, I think, a lot of times. So it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. But at the same time, I think the public has come to accept bad quality, bad shots, or different, different, I guess, 
shortcuts. Yeah, I, I think, I think the where the internet allows is, yeah. allows is a lot of people uh, to, to post things and get a tremendous audience. And funny thing is, is that it really relies on the, the things that are getting these tremendous audiences are oftentimes the things that are either truly funny you know, truly just unique, have a great story behind them. So in a way, you're kind of getting back to the power of, of the story. And the medium by which it's delivered matters less. Because if it makes us laugh, it makes us cry, if it makes us, you know, say wow. And, uh, you know, you're getting 26 million, 50 million hits on YouTube. That's an unpre- you know, unprecedented success. And, and you, you know, if you get 26 million views on YouTube, you're then going to be on CNN that night because something went viral. And you see it all the time. You know, something went viral. Uh, somebody's birthday party video went viral. Somebody's, uh, you know, uh, uh, very private moment with their new puppy went viral. So it, it and, comes down to it comes down to the story because ultimately what a story is is relating to your viewer and telling the story by relating to your viewer. These puppies, these other it, these it, other things. That's what's what you're doing. Exactly, you can relate to that. Well, exactly. Right. And, right? and it, the ironic thing there is that sometimes it's the true reality that really catches us and really punches through and that grasps enormous audiences, you know, around the world. And we're no longer barred by how, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the information or the is, is, is transmitted or it is, or is accessed, I guess, because it's not transmitted. So if something is truly, uh, uh, interesting or, or it truly captures our imagination or captures our emotions, you know, we're then inclined to share that. And then the, the you know, the sharing is, you know, it, it becomes exponential and it almost becomes limitless it, as people, you know, say, hey, you got to check this out. And then we see those enormous uh, uh, numbers get racked up on these social media sites. And, and, and we marvel at that, mm-hmm. you know, that that a, a two minute video garnered a, you know, a, a 58 million uh, person, you know, viewing and, you know, uh, if something gets 25 million viewers on, on cable television, uh, that in of itself is news. But we get videos on the Internet that get 58, 100 million views, you know, pretty routinely these days yeah. uh, from audiences around the world. So it's interesting that, 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 that those true reality moments are actually competing with what we call the scripted reality. But, I, you know, the, it just gets back to what, what is successful on TV is, is really the, the ability, the process, I think, is... There's more emphasis on the process uh, of the delivery. Your networks are still looking for, uh, uh, you know, good content, but the process and, and of course, the talent end up becoming, you know, some of the major uh, decision. Well, we're going to take a break there, Brian, and uh, break this into two parts. Thanks for joining me for this part. Thank you, Michael. Brian's been using drones as aerial camera platforms in cinematography for a number of years. We'll talk about that on part two with Brian Kelly. The podcast is Stay Relevant, Wandering Conversations with Interesting People. Original music by Popmark Media on the web at popmarkmedia.com. See and hear more on my website at mikesabola.com. Until next time, try and stay relevant.